It is fitting, my dear siblings in Christ, I believe, that we are gathered here this evening on the day the church remembers the disciple Andrew. Because who doesn't love a good call narrative? <laughs> Most of us here have thought long and hard about this sense of being called. After all, we're seminary students. We're those discerning calls to ministry. We're those in the thick of our ministries, whether as clergy or lay leaders or church musicians. So all of us here are surely serious Christians who can relate to Jesus' words to Simon, Simon Peter and Andrew, and to James and John. Follow me. And they did. And so do we. But as familiar as this call story is, I have been wondering whether we got it wrong. What if one commentator is right, who argues that this first call narrative in Matthew is actually Jesus' first miracle? Yes, that's right. It's the miracle of Jesus' powerful word that creates following, that makes disciples. That sounds convincing to me, because I don't know about you, but my response to Jesus' call on my life hasn't quite been like this one for Peter, <laughs> Andrew, James, and John. My response has been complicated, full of twists and turns, and not at all immediate like we're told it was for these first disciples. I mean, doesn't anyone else find it amazing that they didn't at least first ask, where are we going? <laughs> They just dropped their nets and followed him. Immediately, Matthew tells us, immediately, they dropped everything and followed him. Just look at the student body of Candler, or any seminary around, I would guess, and you'll see that it's not only young people in their 20s who are pursuing theological education. It's also people in their second or third careers who are entering ministry. People who surely may have felt Jesus tug, Jesus call on them earlier in life, but for some reason or another, couldn't respond until now. Some of us, too, may have gotten mixed signals from the church, since none of us here, I don't think, have had the benefit of a personal encounter in human form from Jesus, like these disciples. All of us, then, it's been left up to the church and fellow disciples to help us discern and figure out how we're being called. And frankly, we don't always get it right. Just think about the history of ministry and leadership for gays, women, and other minorities. So perhaps our respective sense of being called didn't result in the same kind of immediacy that it did for these guys. But we're here now. And I would venture to guess that there are other aspects of this call narrative with which we can relate. You know, because they didn't only leave immediately, they left their family, too. They left their jobs, they left their means for security and income, they left behind their homes and a familiar routine for life. Sound familiar? Yes, I would venture to guess that we who are gathered here know something about what dear Bonhoeffer calls the cost of discipleship. But the truth is that Jesus said it first. Right? Jesus said, it's not going to be easy. A parallel part to this call story that comes later in Matthew is about the disciples commissioning when he sends them forth to go do this fishing for people. And he didn't sugarcoat it. He said it's going to be hard. He said there's a lot of work to do. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He said you'll even be persecuted for it. He said we'll be like sheep sent out into the midst of wolves. He said it was an all-in thing. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus himself made it pretty clear that following him is not an easy task. I know we're people who know this. There are certainly many joys and privileges of ministry. But I think many of us lately have been feeling the burden of ministry. In class with Ken and Alicia two weeks ago, our class was processing the election a bit together, acknowledging to ourselves the challenge it will be as future leaders of the church at this time, at 
this unique time in our country's history. Many of us expressed how we see with new eyes the divide that exists in our country between so-called educated elite liberals and more conservative citizens who live in the South, in the middle of the U.S. And we're coming to terms with what role we will play in a denomination that faces serious needs for transformative change. Well, my friends, that's the cost of discipleship. But it's not just about the election. Sometimes ministry is just downright challenging, am I right? I ask people to share with me some of the low points of your ministries. One of you said your low point in ministry was in sitting with a young mother who was dying of cancer. You said the young mother yelled at you when you didn't have a clear answer on why God was taking her away from her 10-year-old son. That's the cost of discipleship. Someone else also mentioned other deaths being their low points in ministry, particularly when young people die. How can we bring a pastoral presence into people's most profound experiences of grief and loss? That's the cost of discipleship. Some of us have even experienced the discernment process itself as one of our lowest points <laughs> in discipleship. <laughs> As my bishop, Marianne Buddy, puts it, discernment in the Episcopal Church is like taking your heart out of yourself, throwing it over a ten-foot fence, and hoping against hope that someone is on the other side to catch it. Mm. That's the cost of discipleship. Some of us, too, have encountered some pretty low points in our academic lives here at Candler in trying to write papers that just won't come. And trying to keep up with the demands of life as a full-time student, there have been many times many of us didn't know if we would make it. That's the cost of discipleship. In seminary, and I'm sure beyond it, some of us have had serious doubts about the very nature of God and about God's role in human suffering. We've been trying to discern things like what it means that God has a preferential love for the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. And we're discerning that alongside the fact that we're coming to terms with the fact that for the most part, the Episcopal Church does not make up a membership of the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. The transformative change facing us, we realize, rests on our shoulders. And that's the cost of discipleship. The diversity at Candler, too, has helped many of us better understand how the experiences of our black and brown classmates, friends, and neighbors have awakened in us this sense of doing our part toward dismantling systemic racism in America. And especially for those of us who are white, we've struggled with coming to understand how we're complicit in holding on to those things that make our lives easier, our lives more comfortable. And more importantly, we're working to move past our guilt in waking up to that fact so that we can do the hard work that's required of us. That's the cost of discipleship. No one told us it was going to be easy, right? So why do we do it? I think the answer is very easy, and it's right in today's gospel lesson. We do it because... Jesus called us, and Jesus called us first. It's like in our catechism. It's in the prayer book. Have you read it? You know what our official definition of prayer is? I love this. It's responding to God. Responding to God, meaning God is the one who acts first. Our prayers are always a response to something that God has already placed on our heart. In today's passage, Jesus is the one who is active. He was the one who was walking by. He sought them out. He saw them first. He spoke. They didn't. Jesus is the one who acts first. I think that's a helpful reminder since sometimes some of us are looking for Jesus. Where, where are you, Jesus? <laughs> but just in the very nature of the fact that we're called, God is the one who acted first. And I have bad news. For those of us in seminary anticipating eagerly the end of our discernment processes. 
a young priest who began his ordained ministry several years before us, let me in on a secret recently. Discernment never ends. Jesus doesn't stop calling us. We will be discerning the rest of our lives. Which parish am I being called to? What task am I being called to do? Is Jesus calling me to say that? Is Jesus calling me to a new ministry? Discernment keeps going and going. But in discerning how Jesus is calling us, throughout our lives we can trust that it's Jesus who's acting first. So maybe that commentator is right. Maybe this was Jesus' first miracle. Maybe we are his latest miracles. Because we do this thing called ministry, we do this thing called discipleship, because we've come to know God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We felt God's Spirit speaking to us and working through us in such a way that we've come to believe with all of our hearts that the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement has something to contribute in making this world more just, more loving, more like the kingdom of God. And what sustains us in our ministries are these miracles of Jesus. When deep pastoral connections are kindled between you and someone completely unlike yourself, Perhaps like one of you who told me about a person experiencing homelessness who came to you for prayer and support. And that over the course of your summer doing CPE, the two of you came to love each other in a real and genuine and unexpected way. Jesus did that. Hmm. Or think about those times when the church finally gets it right. Like when we celebrate the equality of love among those couples who've been told all their lives that God wants nothing to do with them, that they're an abomination. But then finally the church affirms that God has indeed called them to be together. The church finally affirms that God loves you just the way you are because that's the way that God made you. Jesus did that. Or one of you mentioned those times when you, you get to be the one who performs a wedding. Or you get to be the one who baptizes in the name of the Father. Son and the Holy Spirit, or you're the one who someone reaches out to in the midst of their most vulnerable of circumstances, and you remember what your ministry is all about. You remember why it's worth it. Jesus did that. The Jesus we follow indeed represents a God of high expectations, but he also represents a loving and merciful and encouraging God, because the same Jesus who demands all of what we have is the same Jesus who bids, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. May these words comfort us when we're feeling the cost of discipleship, the burden of ministry. And may we be sustained by the fact that Jesus is still working with us and through us, so that in his name we may do his work, and in doing it, realize that we are his latest miracles. In the name of God, undivided trinity.